the cold is back. So prepare your blankets and get comfortable for this long, dark and chilly night. As we let the darkness take control. So my uncle is an avid outdoorsman, with a bit of hippie wanderlust. He did the Peace Corps twice, once in Kenya, and another time in Egypt. He's seen some stuff, some creepy stuff in those countries, including weird rituals, and the aftermath of some murders. Anyway, he's an outdoor guy, who always was best friends with a Native American fellow and would hunt with him in the traditional bow and arrow style just to be closer to nature. Hunt and gather from the wild and use everything up sort of attitude. He didn't take the modern world for granted. My uncle and his friend hunted deer, mainly in southern Ohio, in an area called Hocking Hills, which touches the Appalachian Mountains. A bit of the area's backstory there have been years worth of reports of wild people living in the woods down there. Like people who go off the grid kind of deal. Also, talk of cults living in the woods. There's also a consistent rumour that people out in the world practice cannibalism. Rumour got invigorated by the reports of some backwards person coming into one of the local towns smashing a bunch of stuff, and later being diagnosed with advanced mad cow disease, but for people. Basically, a misfolded protein starts multiplying in your brain, and it eats away in your neurons, making your brain look like Swiss cheese. Funny thing about getting prion disease, as it's called, is that you can get it by eating the protein of your own species cow eating ground up cow in their feed, or human on human cannibalism, particularly brain matter. Of course, it can happen when the same species eat each other, and then eating that infected animal and human can get it. But yeah, woods, cannibals, disease stories. So my uncle and his buddy are taking advantage of a brilliant full moon and a clear night to go out and set up to hunt some deer in Hocking Hills. They hike way out into the deep woods late at night, and set up their perch, and hut high up in the trees, near a pine grove clearing, so they'll have some good visuals of the ground below. Inevitably, my uncle has to do what nature calls, and leaves the perch, and hikes out a bit to do his business just to prevent animals getting wind of the human scent. This is now in full moonlight, so my uncle feels pretty confident where he's going and where he came from. Then, a random cloud covers the moon it's totally dark, and he made the mistake of not having a headlamp with him. So he waits until the cloud moves along, or until his eyes adjust, and then he hears the screaming. Not just screaming, but like laughing screaming and very very human sounding like the closest thing he said was that it was circling hyenas on the savannah that he remembers in Kenya but also blood curdling like make your veins turn to ice just out of absolutely nowhere and this is in Ohio so he bolts runs like a crazy person back to where he thought he came from ducking under bushes and hiding behind rocks. When the laughter slash screaming sound gets closer, again, this is a guy who's seen some pretty messed up stuff overseas and he's tumbling and fumbling over himself trying to run away. So the moon comes out again and my uncle finds himself in the pine grove clearing near where his buddy is, quiet, then more screaming. He's like F cannibals and finds the tree where the perch is at and bare finger climbs up that damn tree, like his life depends on it, fractures a bunch of his nails, and the buddy is still up there in the perch. My uncle is freaking out. He tells his buddy that the cannibals are here, and that they're totally screwed. 
His friend just laughs at him. He tells my uncle that the sound he's been hearing, the laughing slash screaming, is the sound of deer and heat and getting it on. Like a bunch of deer doing it everywhere. That it's super rare to be able to hear and that they're lucky to experience it. I think I heard that my uncle wanted to punch his friend, but they laugh about it instead and talk about the good spot and that they'll likely get a buck that night with all the activity. Although they appreciate just how much that's gonna suck for the buck. All of a sudden, a whole group of deer trot into the clearing. My uncle and his friend get ready to shoot. But then all of a sudden, the deer stop and turn their heads in the same direction and then bolt like a stampede away. My uncle and his buddy are so confused and then in the clearing come three or four people. They're carrying something that has the shape and weight of another person. Again, this is in the middle of the woods. They walk right into the moonlight and it's like a freaking body they're carrying. They look like haggard woods people. They have dark purple stuff on their upper bodies. And my uncle goes to ask his buddy a question about if they're seeing what they're actually seeing. But before he can say it, his friend shuts him up by covering his mouth. The people walk away not seeing the perch. My uncle says that his friend gets real serious and starts counting his arrows. After about 30 minutes, my uncle's friend tells my uncle that they must not sleep that night and not to make much noise. Then starts mumbling a soft native chant. They don't sleep and no one returns to the clearing and the sun comes up very sunny clear day they look around there's nobody it's very quiet they make their way down to the perch leaving most of their stuff in the perch because they want to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible they get back to the truck parked alongside the road and head immediately to the nearest ranger station to tell them what happened they both get the breathalyzer because yeah the story could have totally been the product of one too many Budweiser lights, but they're stone cold sober. They convince the ranger that something went down. A few rangers then go with them, back to check the clearing out, and for my uncle to get his gear. While my uncle and his friend are packing up the area, the rangers walk into the area, and then all of a sudden, they all get buzzing. My uncle goes to see what's up and the ranger found a few blood spots that look like a blood trail. They do a spot check of the blood with their gearbox and determine it's not deer, but rather human blood. My uncle's like, well, forget this. We're gonna leave the ranger in order for them to radio the station. So fast forward later that day when my uncle and his friend are back home relaxing a bit after the ordeal. Both guys are fastidious and clean everything to put away. And then my uncle said that his friend just stopped dead cold and then looks at him. He tells my uncle that he began the night with two quivers with six arrows each. He now only has nine arrows. There are three missing. He for sure counted 12 when he recounted in the middle of the night and shit went down. In their haste, they left the hunting gear all the way up the perch when they got down in the morning, but it was secure, like everything strapped into quivers and then strapped in the perch. So someone must have been watching them that morning and taken the arrows when they left. My uncle's friend promptly got rid of his bow and arrows after that, saying that he can't have them around anymore due to bad spirits. Even did a ritual with some of his tribe and my uncle as they touched dark spirits and had to be purified. We later learned that the blood ended up matching some missing persons case. My uncle and his friend were questioned again. They never found any kind of human remains anywhere near where the blood was originally found there. They even brought in dogs from what I heard. Said missing person never became found again either. My uncle was told that a possible homicide can't be proved or considered because it was just him and his friend in the dark one night from far up in some trees. 
Besides that, there was no evidence found. That's why there wasn't any crime. So, mystery. But my uncle is convinced that what he heard that night running back from when he went down to go to the toilet was probably more than just deers doing their thing. Suffice to say, that was the last time they went into Hocking Hills Woods for deer hunting. They were also banned from considering going to Hocking Hills for family day hikes. To this day, I'm super wary of hiking anywhere in the Appalachians. This is by far the most creepy thing that has happened to me to date. I usually feel fairly safe in my town, but this one incident has certainly awakened me to the fact that no place is perfectly safe. It was this New Year's Eve just gone, when my friend called me and asked if I wanted to go to the New Year's Eve festival at the beach with her and her boyfriend. Being the kind of person who normally just stays at home and does nothing special for this particular holiday, I of course agreed. New Year's Eve in my town holds a festival at the beach in celebration. Rides and games are set up, bands play live, clubs hold late night fancy dress parties, and at midnight on the dot, a series of firework displays are put on for the public. Normally thousands of people turn up, so the beach can get quite loud and crowded, but it's still a pleasant atmosphere all around. Before hanging up, my friend Jess asks me if I will pick up her and her boyfriend Tyler on my way to the beach. She also lets me know that one of our other closest friends will be coming along, and that we should go straight to her unit so that we can all walk down to the festival together. I told Jess it won't be a problem, and then go get ready. After about an hour I'm ready. I do not yet have my license, so I need to ask my dad if he will pick up my friends and drop us all off. He agreed, and it only takes about 3 minutes to drive to my friend's place, and then a further 10 minutes to drive to my other friend's unit. My other friend Haley lives in a small two bedroom unit with her mother and the unit is right next to the beach and it only takes around 5 minutes to walk down to where the festival takes place. When we arrive, she is already outside waiting for us, standing on the balcony and enjoying the sunset. We all file out the car, making sure to thank my dad for dropping us off and then head upstairs to greet Haley. We all hug and begin catching up, as we hadn't seen each other for a couple of months. We all headed inside for about 10 minutes to grab a drink and catch up a bit more. Haley's mother came out and spoke to us for a bit as well. At this point the sun had almost very well truly disappeared, and so we decided this was the perfect time to head down to the festival. The walk down to the beach was pleasant. It was a warm summer night, and there was a cool breeze to ward off the heat, and the whole area smelled of cotton candy, buttered corn and warm donuts. We spent the first few hours going on rides together, and then we went and bought some food, and sat down on the sand to eat it. So far the night was amazing, as usually whenever I went out with my friends, there was always a parent with us, but not this time. It felt great. It felt like freedom. After eating, we went up to the stage where the live bands were playing and danced for about an hour. There were plenty of classics being played like YMCA, Time Warp, and various hits from Greece. All in all, it was a really fun time. After an hour of dancing to music, the four of us decided to head back to Haley's unit for drinks of water as we had all spent all our money. At this point, it was well and truly dark and around 11 o'clock, and the heat of the day had subsided to a pleasant warmth. We walked along the path merrily, saying Happy New Year to every passing group or cop. A few party goers on the fourth floor of the apartment complex shouted, 
Hope you have an epic new year, drunkenly at us. And we laughed and wished them the same. As we walked further away from the crowd and the noise, the lights grew less and less. There aren't many street lights near my friend's unit, and we were soon engulfed in a soothing darkness, with only the moon to light our way. It was at this point that I for some reason began to feel uneasy. It was too quiet for my taste. You know that feeling that you get when you're being watched? Or at least when you think that you are being watched? That exact feeling washed over me, and I subconsciously moved to walk in between Haley and Tyler, instead of walking on the outside of the group. I shrugged off the feeling after that, attributing it to the fact that perhaps my ears were just used to the loud noise of the festival. They were ringing a bit after all. We ran into another group of people that we knew from school along the way, and the feeling was completely forgotten. I had missed these people after graduation, and immediately struck up friendly, light-hearted conversation. We parted and made ways to Haley's unit, and climbed the stairs in. Haley's mother and her boyfriend greeted us upon arrival, and we all got drinks of water from the refrigerator before relaxing together on the couch. We were all a tad worn out at this point, and the fireworks weren't for at least another hour. So we decided to chill at the unit and head down to the beach around a quarter to 12. We all joined around and had snacks. And then Haley asked if she could sleep over at my place. I ring my folks to make sure it's okay with them and they give me the okay. My parents love having Haley over. She's a very well-mannered person, and likes to help out where she can. At a quarter to twelve, we all leave the unit and begin heading down the beach. We only get about a minute down the road before Haley says that she has forgotten her pain medication for her bad knee, which she is supposed to take before bed. At this, Jess seems a little annoyed, but reluctantly agrees that we should go back so that we don't have to make another trip back before the night ends. We head back, and the whole way just seems to be a little distant. Like her mind is not the conversation at hand, and she's more focused on something else. I am the most quiet and observant of the group, so I notice her silence quite quickly, since she's usually quite a chatterbox. I ask her if she's alright, and she just says, of course. And so I simply leave her to her thoughts. Perhaps she was just pissed that we had to go back and get the pills. Upon retrieving Haley's pain medication, we head back out again. And this time Jess suggests that we walk on the other side of the road. It's more well lit, and there are parents with children on the playground. We think nothing of it and agree, as both Haley and I have poor night sight and a bit of light would be rather welcome. When we are halfway across the road, Jess mutters to me, don't look behind. My first thought is that maybe there is a drunk person with their pants down, urinating against a wall or something. But then Jess adds to the whole group, walk faster. I begin to feel uneasy, and immediately we all obey her request knowing that whenever Jess tells us to do something seriously, it's usually for good reason. Word goes around the group to not look back, and despite the nagging human instinct to look, I trust Jess. When we are across the road, I ask Jess what was wrong, and what has her so on edge. She replies, There's three guys in black hoodies following us. I recognised them from earlier. Earlier? I think to myself puzzled. And then Jess explains that she saw those same three men when we came from the unit from water earlier. A chill runs down my spine, and I realise that my sense of being watched probably came from those men. What made me even more creeped out though, is the fact that they had waited for us to come out. Unable to resist, I glance sideways out of my peripheral vision, and my heart hammers into my chest when I notice the three men. 
They are indeed rather pointedly following us and having their zipped hoods all the way up to their chins. This would not be so unusual if it weren't for the fact that it was quite hot at night and there would be no need for a hoodie or any other kind of jacket. They were also wearing bandanas over their mouths and noses and I couldn't make out either of their facial features and this scared me. Jess prompts us to not look again and suggest that we walk even faster. So we do so. Despite the fact that Haley, Taylor and I are all tall and strongly built people. I should mention now that we're 18 year old females and despite my build and reasonable strength, I understandably wouldn't want to tangle with three big unknown men dressed in all black with bandanas covering their faces. It crossed my mind that they probably thought we were good targets. Jess was short and thin. They most likely heard that Haley needed pain medication and I walked with an obvious limp as I have arthritis in my right knee and Tyler had his hands full, being the Pakyak as they call it. Despite Jess's instruction, I can't help but give the occasional glance at the men and of course they continue to follow us. They had even increased their pace to match ours and kept looking over at us. I think they meant to intimidate us as they made it quite obvious that they were staring. I ceased to look after realizing that they could probably tell we were keeping an eye on them and instead opted to use my keen hearing to make sure they stayed across the road. I wasn't fond of this as they could have had a knife or gun or anything if they suddenly sprinted at least we wouldn't be prepared but I didn't want to provoke them more by staring. I am not a fast runner and my stamina leaves much to be desired. At this point the path ends and gives way to bushes and shrubs. The brushland is quite easy to go around but doing so would mean going closer to the unknown men following us and none of us wanted to do that. So we all make an unspoken agreement to take a shortcut through the bushes. The bushland doesn't go on for very long and it would take us straight to the festival where we could quite possibly lose these men. We head into the bushes, taking care to stay together and watch for snakes as summer is the season when the snakes like to come out most, especially at the beach. It's Snake City. About halfway through, we all recognize the sound of dried grass and leaves crunching underfoot and then we hear rapid heavy footsteps. We all broke into a sprint, not daring to look back at that point. We didn't have to look to know that those men were chasing us and their confidence of going after four fully grown teenagers pretty much assured me that they were armed with weapons of some sort. We were not armed with anything and quite frankly, we were all so spooked that we couldn't think straight. Our only instinct was to run as fast as possible. We made it out of the bushland, raced across the park and slowed to a jog when we reached the crowd. We didn't stop though, but we steadily slowed to a hurried walk. I looked over my shoulder and recognized the three unknown men lurking across the car park. Moonlight glinted off the surface of a metallic object in the taller one's hand and I immediately felt ill. We hurried down to where the biggest crowd was, gathering on the sand in preparation for the fireworks, picking a spot between two large groups, and we settled down and caught our breath. Funnily enough, all four of us have asthma, which we often joke about saying that we found each other and bonded because of it and we were all panting quite heavily. Tyler and I have it a bit worse than Jess and Haley, and you could hear us wheezing as we panted. Soon the fireworks started and we had all calmed enough to somewhat enjoy them although the unknown men were still in the back of our minds. Our original plan had been to leave before the fireworks were finished so that we could avoid the big crowds but instead, we opted to leave with the crowds and we walked down the road to the bigger car park where my dad was going to pick us up, making sure to stay around people. When we reached the car park, 
I called my dad, and he said that he would be there to pick us up in around 10 minutes. And after hanging up, I sat on the side of the path with my friends and waited. Five minutes passed, and bored. I decided to look around, as there were many bustling crowds making their way to their cars. There was a bit of a traffic jam too, as many cars were trying to leave at the same time. I looked across the road and realized, with a jolt, that three men in black hoodies were just there, half hidden behind a tree where there was no light. Even though I couldn't see their eyes, I could tell they were staring right back at me. They knew I'd spotted them. The taller one discreetly showed his knife, waving it a little as if to taunt me. Then he raised it to his throat and made a slow mock slicing motion. I quickly told my friends and we moved to a different spot, making sure to stay in the light and stay in sight of people. My dad arrived shortly after and we quickly climbed in the car and none of us spoke a word of what happened. And since then, I haven't had any issues with anyone following me or my friends. It still gives me the creeps though. Whoever those men were with their intentions, could not have been good. My father is a logger, specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to specified lengths, which means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forest. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is that he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut, not on how long it took him. So my dad used to work 16 to 20 hour days constantly to try and get as much done as quickly as possible. And then the rest of the crew would come clean up the trees and ship them to the mill. He used to work around 50% of the time alone and the rest of the time with another tree saw operator called Rene. He would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. So anyway, my dad and Rene were put on a new job site and about 10 days in, everything was going as planned. But they constantly heard weird chitter chatter over the radio that was such poor quality, no words could be heard and whatever radio channel they changed it to it followed them. As they progressed through the job and went further up the mountain, the words from the radio slowly became more audible. Both of them agreed, based on the small parts of conversation that they could hear, that something was wrong. They also started finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been there people should not have been there, as it was a two and a half hour drive up a mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road, so their trucks and equipment could make it up. They came to the realization that they are in a very secluded area, with people who shouldn't be there, and the worst part is, they aren't scheduled to leave for about another week. They would only leave to refuel the truck with gasoline for matches and they would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Rene comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate the tent and find one lone sleeping bag and a duffel bag. They investigate the duffel bag and find many pairs of children's underwear and things that appear to be a rape kit, like rope, duct tape, sketched images of children being molested, 
and photographs of children that appear unaware that they are being photographed. In the tent, they also find a small amount of food, which includes canned goods and an apple, which proved that the tent had been occupied recently because there was no mold on it. They are now alone on a mountain with, at best case scenario, is a really messed up individual. Renee instantly wants to get out of there, but my dad, being the hardest working person I've ever met, insists that they need to finish the job and then leave. They decide that they will not talk over the radios except in case of emergencies and use it to see if they can hear anyone talking over it. My father and Renee are now in close enough range of whoever has been talking over the radio to hear the conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal except for the fact that these guys don't belong here and that the tent is undoubtedly theirs. At the end of the workday, my dad hears them on the radio talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad then hops on the radio and attempts to communicate with them about what the hell they are doing. I believe he said, who are you and what are you doing here? After this, the conversation between the men abruptly stops and they never pick up. That night, Rene wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun. Someone's outside. My dad has told me that the first thing he hears when he wakes up is the quiet shuffling of footsteps. My dad fumbles for his gun and finds it, but realizes that he doesn't have it loaded and has next to no idea where his rounds are and Renee has nothing and the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob and it opens. The camper is far enough off the ground to where you had to jump in and there is no ladder or footstool. It just stays open and neither my dad or Renee move. They hear scratching right outside the door though. And after four minutes of scratching, my dad can no longer take it and nods at Renee. He quietly gets up and walks towards the camper door. And the second he reaches it, he is met with an intense pain across his right eye and to the left of his cheek. He has been cut and falls to the camper hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him and he is soon being kicked in the top of the head by a man behind him. Rene leaps off the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad and my dad gets up and realizes that the second man without a knife is running away and the man with a knife is scrambling away from Rene and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Renee get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cuts and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up the job, one of them was found gagged, bound, raped, murdered and thrown into a ditch. No one has been convicted of these crimes. To this day, my father can hardly see out of his right eye, and the pupil is disfigured and looks more like a cat's eye than a human's. He suffers from PTSD and hasn't slept a good night's sleep since. I am a fairly small girl, although I pretend my five foot tall self isn't afraid of anything. I have facial piercings and brightly colored hair with an attitude to match. I started working at a gas station in one of the smaller areas of my city in March of 2013. I was 19 and absolutely loved my job. I had lovely regulars 
and one or two creepy late night visitors every so often, but nothing I couldn't handle on my own. Shortly after, I started work at an ice cream shop and a barber shop, both owned by the same family, opened up in the same plaza. Super cool, right? One day in summer, the barber came over to the gas station, drove over one of the gas tank covers, and sort of flipped, leaving the pipe leaking down into the tank exposed. Because the gasoline is stored in huge tanks underground, any opening in the pipes leading to them is a hazard for many reasons. Sparks, rainwater, etc. And of course, knowing the risks, I was worried. I walked out with him to the crowded parking lot and noticed he was looking at me funny. He said, You look good today, which I shrugged off as a genuine compliment. Careful not to give him the wrong impression, I just nodded a quick thanks. I was uneasy about the way he was looking at me, but I didn't stress too much because there were people all over the place. I quickly kicked the cover over back in place, not really wanting to bend down before I thanked him. And I headed back to my spot behind the service counter, knowing there would be customers waiting for service. He came back in a short while later with a bowl of ice cream from his other shop and placed it down on my counter saying, I'm sorry for pulling you away from work. I was just worried about someone getting hurt. I smiled and thanked him, moving the bowl over to the other side of the computer. I went to get my wallet and he promptly refused saying, all I needed to give him was a kiss. I laughed thinking he was just harmlessly joking like most of my elder clientele. And I joked saying, no kisses, but if I could, I would give you a hug. Just assuming he knew about the rules of my workplace, as well as general not being a creeper. Following the little exchange, he told me there was some mixed up chocolate bars on the outside of the counter, as well as a couple of empty boxes. My work was always very picky about the display at the front, so without thinking, I immediately went over to fix them. I felt his hand graze my behind, so I quickly stood up and stomped my foot on his, saying, I think it's time for you to get out of my workplace and go back to your own. I quickly made my way back behind the counter, and he thoroughly apologised, saying something about how he was just adjusting his apron, and that he would never do such a thing. I started to feel a little like I'd overreacted, until I realised it was absolutely impossible for a vehicle to flip the tank cover. It clicked in my mind that the covers are made to be driven over, like the sewage drain covers, and that without some serious force, they would not move unless lifted with the gasoline delivery pickaxe thing. The barber had obviously kicked it in to get my attention, and I repeated my requests for him to leave me alone and he grabbed my arm. He said it in a very menacing sort of way, that I would have an affair with him before smiling and walking out the door. I threw out the ice cream right away, not having touched it and went back to my business trying to keep myself calm. The next couple of days went by without incident, but the third night he started to drive by after I'd close and locked up for the night. As I was counting my cash, he would blow me kisses and wave weirdly, or sign that he was offering me a ride home. I always pretended not to see him but I began to call people on my phone every time I had the closing shift. It escalated when I thought I saw his vehicle parked out back by the garbage bins, light off and in the dark with someone sitting on the driver's side. I called the police and explained what had been happening, telling them I was afraid for my safety. They came quickly and found out it was just some kids smoking dope in a vehicle that just happened to be the same make and model as his but I felt better knowing that they had been made aware. After the police report was filed, he didn't bother me for a couple of weeks. Thinking it had stopped for good, my boyfriend took me over for an ice cream date after checking to make sure he wasn't in for the day. The next night, I was with my friends about five minutes before closing. He stormed in practically threw a bowl of ice cream at me, spitting, have a great night and angrily rushed out. I was very confused and scared, 
wondering if he knew we'd gone to the shop. The next day, he walked by the pumps and looked around at each camera, and then back at me with a smile and a wave. I saw on the other cameras that he was looking at the ones around the building as well. I called my dad and he picked me up that night. After that, I decided I'd had enough for the day, and I went into his barber shop with an RCMP officer I knew very well. I told him he was no longer welcome on the gas station premises, and that if he came back when I was inside, the police would be notified. He started off by acting confused and a little hurt, and that I was making such awful accusations, but ended by yelling at me, and telling me that he would find me and hurt me, because I was a slut and would get what I deserved. I was scared, because besides the one small joke I made, I made it clear to him that he was not welcome anywhere near me. I quit my job shortly after that, and haven't hung around the place besides the time I need to stop in and get gas in a rush. A few weeks before I quit my job though, whilst the creep was hanging out, another man walked in, noticing I was uncomfortable. He waited for the creep to leave before asking me if I was okay. I smiled and said, yeah, of course. What can I get for you? He told me he could start by telling him the truth. He slid me a business card across the counter, and I looked down and I saw that it was a police information card. I looked up at him, and he smiled and he said, give me a call to my extension this evening when you finish work. I work around here, so if anything is wrong, I would feel better being informed so I can keep an eye out. I thanked him profusely, and he went on his way. Late that night, I called and filled him in, but asked him not to file a report because the police had already been notified prior to my phone call to him. The next day, he came over to my house to take another statement and give me information for what I should do, like press charges or try for a restraining order, as well as give me case numbers and other pertinent information about the creep. He met my dad, and they talked about being a police officer for a while, and then we all sat down to discuss the situation. My laptop background was a slightly sexy Halloween photo of my boyfriend and I, where I had my leg up a fake gun, and was dressed up as a sexy Eagle Scout. I completely forgot what my background was, since my laptop had sat unused for a couple of weeks, and he made a lewd comment about not wanting to see any of my homemade videos that my boyfriend and I had made. It made me feel quite uncomfortable, but I shrugged it off. I quickly opened a Word document and wrote down what he told me, whilst googling the barber and giving him information on what I was finding. It turned out that he was in a lot of trouble for fraud, theft and a few other things. After a few weeks, I told the barber to stop coming into the store and it led to a rather huge altercation at his barber shop, so I decided to just drop it. It wasn't worth the anxiety it was causing me, but I kept talking to the police officer, who would drop into my work or send me a text every so often to ask me how I was doing, and if everything was okay. I appreciated his concern, since it made me feel like I could count on him if I was ever stuck, you know? A few months later, he sent me a text asking how I'd been since leaving the gas station, and how school was. He told me it had been so long, he didn't remember what I looked like. I just said, I'm still an angry punk rock metal lady. And he said, ah, oh, send me a photo. I felt really uncomfortable, so I never replied, deleting the conversation and going about my daily activities. I didn't hear from him for a while, about November, to shortly before New Year's. It was just before New Year's Eve, and I was on my way to a doctor's appointment to confirm some pretty sad news, when he sent me a text asking me what I was doing for New Year's Eve. I didn't reply then and there, but a few days later, after New Year's, I told him it was good, and he asked me if I'd gotten lucky. I told him that was inappropriate and unacceptable, to which he responded, you know, you'd be a lot less grouchy if you got laid regularly. 
the way he said it, along with a winky face, made it obvious he was insinuating that I go to him for that. I was so angry and scared, since he knew where I lived and worked, as well as where I went to school. I deleted the conversation and blocked the number. I called my boyfriend that night, and cried about it to him. And he gave me a ton of shit for not being smarter and not keeping it. I even tried calling Apple in California to see if they could do anything to retrieve the texts, since they're all stored internally anyway. Of course, they refused because of privacy issues, but at least I tried. I saw him again in July, after a disastrous night at the bar. I was walking down the street with my friend, and he was at the end of his driveway. He asked why I never texted him anymore, and I just sort of gave an excuse and hurried away. She looked at me at once, we were in a safe place, and said, You don't even have to tell me. I can tell by the look he gave you. Promise me you won't walk down that street anymore alone. It's quite unsurprising that after all this crap, I'm having serious trust issues with new people. I have been hiking since I was a kid, so I have a number of stories. The most terrifying one happened to me when I was 16. I just got my license and I decided to go on a three-day solo hike. On my second day, I was stopping at a river to collect and purify water. When I was getting my water, I heard what sounded like a wind chime on the other side of the river. On the other side, I walked back about 20 feet and saw probably about a dozen small houses made of sticks, bark and logs. The houses were only a couple of feet big and I kept walking on a path that the houses were on. And it led me down a small hill. At the bottom there was a house, made the same as the others but full size. Attached to the front were the wind chimes. From afar, I saw animal pelts, and I assumed the guy living there hunted them, and just had the pelt on display. But when I got closer, I saw they were whole rotten carcasses. I got out of there, grabbed my bag, and hiked through part of the night just to get away as quickly as possible. I couldn't really sleep. I kept hearing the wind chime. I think it was all just in my head. The next morning I still had a whole day's hike until I got to the end where the rangers were. And when I got there, I told them what I saw and pointed it out on a map. They told me that they would go check it out, get rid of everything that was authorised, and if anyone was there to kick them out. They thanked me and left. I know some rangers at different parks, and I know they carry guns. I assume they went there armed, and dealt with whoever was building there. I haven't been back to find out what they discovered, and I don't want to risk it. A few years ago when I was 19, I was coming home from watching the fireworks display on New Year's Eve. It was 3am when I reached my safe, family friendly, nothing ever happened neighbourhood. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and live in a posher and wealthier area. My friends wanted to call a taxi, because we didn't want to wake our poor parents at this hour to drive us home. Because of my stubbornness and insistence, we ended up taking the very long walk home. My friend Aiden was complaining most of the time. Guess you can't blame him. Rowan was just silent and compliant. I was cheerful. When we reached almost my street, we split ways. The guys continued on their very long walk home, much longer than mine, and I continued on to mine. When I passed a little cake shop, I noticed a guy across the street. I only looked at him briefly, but something in the way he quickly looked up at me almost in interest caught my attention. I hurried on anyway, because I'm usually paranoid about things, and 99% of the time it's just me being paranoid. I turned onto my street, 
which was much darker than I'd anticipated. This was around 3.15am, mind you, and as I passed the bowling club and the oval, I kept looking behind me just to make sure. It was getting quite cold and dark, so I started feeling creeped out, but there was no one behind me. No one anywhere I could see anyway. I was halfway down my street, where the road dips down, when I noticed something on the path in front of me. I couldn't tell what it was, and at the last minute I stepped off the path onto the road to avoid it, because it looked like it might be a dead animal, and as I stepped onto the road, I turned slightly and saw that there was someone behind me. They weren't too close, but they weren't too far away either, and I remember my heart leapt into my throat because I hadn't seen them before. And for them to have gotten that close in such a short space of time, well, it didn't sit well with me. When I told people about this later, they said that I should have been quite sus. It's 3am in the morning, and you're quietly walking behind a girl, not even bothering to keep a safe distance. Like if you're really innocent, you take measures to emphasize that, right? I couldn't see who it was, whether it would be male or female, because it was just a black figure to me. It was a very brief glimpse. I was scared though, so I whipped out my phone and started to call Aiden. I kept calling him, but silly Vodafone wouldn't connect me to him. So I tried calling Rowan, but he wouldn't pick up either. I kept this up at least five times, getting increasingly anxious but not daring to look behind me to see if he was still there. I'm glad I didn't actually. I think I would have really freaked out if I confirmed it. By that time, I'd just reached my driveway, and I hurried up it, thinking I would be safe. But, as I was halfway up, I looked over my shoulder again just really quickly, and I saw the figure again. The way I explain this next bit is really confused and muddling, because on the one hand, it may have just looked like he was merely passing my driveway, but on the other, I'm much more certain that it looked like he was about to step onto it. At that precise moment though, it occurred to me that he might be my older brother Jonathan, because no one else would bother walking up my driveway, even if this guy was following me. It never occurred to me that they would really go to all the lengths of to going up my driveway as well. I thought it would be completely safe because I had the advantage of having my house close when he started following me. However, something about the build of the figure didn't really seem like Jonathan to me, so I hurried on in anyway. My beautiful, wonderful, amazing mother had stayed up to wait for me, and I'm so grateful, because she opened the door as soon as I knocked. I hate to imagine what would have happened if I had to have waited for a while. I went inside, but I left the second door open, and the outside light on because I thought, Jonathan might be coming in any second now. But my mum was like, you can turn them off, he came back two hours ago. I did get a little creeped out by then, but I just dismissed the thought, because we are all so quick to think that we are always so safe. I closed the door, shut off the light, and went to grab a drink of water. My mum went to bed, and I went to my room to grab my clothes, and then went into the bathroom to take a shower and I switched off the living room lights. This is sort of funny now to think about it. Before I took the shower, I replied back to a message from Aiden who was asking if I was home safe. I demanded to know why they hadn't picked up the phone, and then told him that I was creeped out for a few minutes but it was okay. Then I showered. I actually thought about the figure. I wasn't too convinced that it was following me but my mind did teeter into wondering this or that. In any case, I remember thinking that it was okay because I was safe now. Then, near the end of my shower, I heard something at the window. It didn't sound like the usual creaking or bumping of an old house. The way I described it to other people was like the sound of someone resting their hands against the window to steady themselves. It sounded really unnatural, I know because it caught my attention straight away, and I immediately jumped to the possibility that there might be someone outside. And I know 
that only a really strange sound could make me do what I did next, which was turn off the water and crouch under the window, hiding and waiting. I waited for some time, too scared to move for a few minutes, but there was nothing. So I gingerly crawled out, still too scared to stand up properly, and I switched off the bathroom lights. But then, it was impossible for me to dry myself and dress myself. So I turned on the heater light, which is much smaller and dimmer. But as I did that, I noticed at the window, there were very small blue lights. That certainly didn't belong there. The only way I can describe it, it was almost like the keypad of a phone was lit up. I was so scared, but I switched off the heater light as well and backed into a corner. My towel wrapped around me and I waited. It seemed like a long time that I waited. I was too scared to unlock the door and move because I knew it would make a lot of noise. And as I waited in the pitch darkness, several blue lights came on outside the window. It became very bright and they were moving it, trying to shine it through the window. Now that I think about it, was it a phone? I'm not sure. But that did it. I practically bolted for my mum. I unlocked the door and went into my parents' room, trembling like a leaf and gibbering that there was someone outside the bathroom window. I was very clearly upset. My mum ushered me around, trying to find a safe room for me to change into. My dad apparently heard the footsteps hurrying back down the driveway, and I'm glad he did, because the situation feels so unreal to me. I'm not even sure if it really happened. Maybe I imagined it. But this is all confirmation that it was not my imagination. I was so shaky. I slid into bed and couldn't sleep the whole night until morning. And even when it was morning, I was terrified. Especially when I heard Dad leave the house and go into the backyard. So that's my lesson learned. I'm never walking home at night again. I'm even a bit worried during the day. We never did find out who it was. People wonder if it was the same person I'd passed earlier, but I don't think so. My brother doesn't think so either. He says that it may have been someone lurking at the oval, who came out of a little hole as I walked past the supposed dead animal on the path, because of how suddenly he appeared behind me. Please don't go walking home alone at night, girls. It only takes one moment for you to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it can go very wrong indeed. My buddy Todd and I were camping at a small state lake in Kansas. The park is surrounded by farmland, with about a mile long gravel road leading up to it, which then goes into the woods and descends to the lake. As anyone who is familiar with gravel roads can attest, it's easy to hear someone coming. The campsite we were staying at was in the hills above the lake and wasn't frequently used, but unfortunately is closed now. We are both light sleepers and would wake up to a moose rustling the leaves near our tent. That night, we were up until sometime after 1am, talking about the old days next to the fire, and we were asleep at around 1.30. We don't like to drink in the woods, because it dulls our senses, and we slept somewhere restlessly, and woke up to every tiny sound that night. Every sound except one that would explain why there was a large bottle of baby oil squarely in front of our tent door in the morning. We both looked at each other in shock and packed up our shit to leave, in case it was a threat of something to come that night. This second story also happened with Todd, but it was at a different campground. We used to like to renegade camp which is a term we made up about camping places that we weren't supposed to be in. We'd choose a park that had a good chunk of woods and closed at sundown, park our cars in a nearby neighborhood and walk in before the park closed. 
we'd set up camp, and after the park was closed, we'd have a little fire in our low-key camp. Very good times. On one of our renegade camping trips, we were staying at the far side of a lake that was very rural. We had some friends drop us off during the day, and we walked deep into the woods near the lake. On this side of the lake, there was no camping allowed, and we hadn't seen anyone else at it. We didn't camp near the water because we didn't want to be seen. The woods were packed with locust trees, with those giant medieval torture thorns, and strung between those trees were ropes like spider webs, with huge face hugs. It made for some pretty uncomfortable progress through ravines. By the time we set up camp, we were pretty jittery from the hike, and a little bloody from all the thorns. When we finally made it to bed that night, we still had the creepy crawlies, and felt like there were spiders on us constantly. So it took us a while to get back to sleep. At around 3 a.m., I was awoken by a hard, flat slap right across the middle of my bare chest. I woke up shouting, what the hell? And Todd was screaming, spiders, spiders are everywhere, they're all over us. And he started frantically trying to get out of the tent whilst wildly swinging around to get the spiders off. He was brushing his body like they were all over him and taking wild swings at his sleeping bag and mine. I was freaking out and flailing at everything trying to get a flashlight to see what the hell was going on. He managed to get the tent door unzipped and had taken two steps in his tidy whities and I started yelling, Todd, you're gonna run into the thorns. And then he stopped and turned around and slowly said, Mike, why am I outside the tent? Like, what the hell? You said there were spiders, I thought. And he replied in a very calm voice, they're gone now, and turned and slowly started getting back into the tent. I'm panting like I'd run a marathon and high as hell on adrenaline. As he calmly gets back in his sleeping bag, I shook him and said, what the hell, what was that? He acted like he'd just woken up. Turns out I was missing one crucial piece of information. My friend Todd was taking a new medication and that had the potential side effect of night terrors. After a few minutes of speaking about what had just happened, I calmed down a little and then off in the woods behind us, we hear Todd, where are you going Todd? You're going to run into the thorns Todd. There was dead silence. We couldn't even breathe. We whispered to each other, what the hell was that? Then we heard the same voice from behind us at a different angle. It traveled several hundred yards left in a couple of seconds. Todd, I'm trying to find you, Todd. Where are you? Holy shit, what the hell are we gonna do? We can't run into the woods, we'll get destroyed in the thorns. We can't hide from something that can move like that. The voice didn't echo. It was just kind of out there. It sounded like it was 50 yards off still. There was no sound at all. Nothing was moving. Then, Todd almost gave me a heart attack by yelling out into the night. I'm fine. Go back to bed. And I slapped the shit out of him. We never got a response. We turned on every light we had, built the fire up until it was about six feet high and waited with wide eyes and pocket knives drawn for the morning to come. I've never been back to that park since. New Year's 2009, going into 2010. I went to visit a friend who was attending university in a nearby city. The house she lived in happened to be a street away from the house I was born in, and spent the first seven years of my life in. 
so I knew the area reasonably well. There were four of us girls, but only myself and the girl who was going uni knew the area. Basically, her house was at the edge of a walled park, which was locked overnight dusk till dawn. On the other side of the park was the main body of the city, including the uni itself, and the majority of the pubs and clubs and drinking places. To get from one to the other, you'd have to go around the park which for the most part is reasonably well lit. We'd spent the night out over New Year's and we'd all gotten pretty drunk. The token lightweights were smashed. The normally sensible ones of the three of us were hiccuping and falling over the place and saying she loved all of us. The uni girl was the usually messy drunk, but she seemed to be holding herself together, though she and I were also stumbling and noticeably drunk anyway. We took the route over the top of the park because it was marginally quicker. As we walked along, we passed the opening of a back alley where we saw a man just standing in the middle of the lane about 30 yards away. He wasn't on his phone. He wasn't with anyone. He was just stood stock still when dressed in dark nondescript clothes directly in the middle of the empty alleyway just facing us. Unigal and I clocked eyes, and both of us knew something was up with this picture. Sensible girl drunkenly decided it would be a great time to yell Happy New Year at the top of her lungs and enthusiastically wave at him. Uni girl and I dragged her away from the alleyway and quickly marched both of them onwards. The uni girl asked me if he was following us, and my heart stopped. As I turned my head, and saw he'd left the alleyway. We sped up. Now Unigal and I realized the predicament easily. We were closer to the front entrance to her house. It was terraced, so a huge row of connected houses. But that could mean that the man, who was casually walking behind us, but definitely gaining, would almost certainly know where we were staying and which house my friend lived in. We decided to take the risk to go around the back and luckily lost him before we got to the alleyway entrance. So he wasn't 100% on where we'd gone or into which house we'd go into. Uni and I got the sensible girl and the lightweight settled down and began sneaking looks out the front window curtains. Only to see him walking up and down the road on the other side, quite obviously peering into windows and looking at lights that were on in the houses. Our skin crawled, so we phoned the non-emergency police number and told them what happened. They sent a car around the block and we saw the dude quickly disappear after that. The next morning, we told the other two what happened. They had no clue the danger that we'd been in. We had the TV on in the background and the local news came on. A girl had been separated from her friends whilst drunk the night before and had been attacked and raped in the same road we saw the man in the first place. Collectively, we were shaken by what could have been. The second part occurred when I happened to move back to the area in 2014. By then I'd totally forgotten about this episode, so I was trying to settle into my job, which had brought me back to the area. I was again on the other side of the park, this time at the bottom, and my new house was a few roads back from where the uni girls had been. So I basically would walk this same road every day to and from work, through the park during the daytime and along the lower wall of the park at night. I would work late on some days, with my hour rotor until 11pm, but often I wouldn't leave to walk home until 12, 1 or even 2. It was a shit job. They kept putting me in on Friday and Saturday nights, which I didn't mind at all. But then two Saturdays in a row, I felt like I was being followed by someone. Though both times I was able to go into a shop to lose them, or to get a friend who lived on their way to come outside their house and chat with me until the person following me turned around or went a different way. I wasn't rooted for weekends for a little bit, so it didn't escalate and it didn't happen on weekdays, so I thought I was being paranoid. 
couple of months later, however, I stayed late at work on a Friday again. It was around 1.30. I was exhausted and ready for bed. I was sleepily wandering my way home, not really paying attention to my surroundings, when a man from the other side of the road crossed towards me. I was immediately alert, wondering what he wanted. He asked me if I had a light, but I said no. I didn't smoke and kept walking. He kept going in the opposite direction behind me, but then I heard his feet turn and his footsteps followed behind mine. I just kept walking. Maybe he was going home for a light. I took my next turn, and sure enough, so did he. We were walking alongside a fairly busy main road, well lit, which had cars going next to it every few minutes. But I was about to turn into a much quieter residential area, where the lights were less frequent, and there wouldn't be cars going past unless going into a house. Not wanting to be paranoid, I decided to do a test on whether this guy was just innocently heading home or actually had another purpose for turning around behind me. This was, by the way, when my brain decides to remind me that we are literally walking right past the house where the first incident occurred. I turn into the residential area. The first building on the right is a funeral home, which has two carports in the back where they keep the hearses. I scooted down past the house barely not breaking into a full-on run, and I hid in one of the carports, sticking my head out of the shadow to watch if he'd first follow me into the residential area, and secondly, if he'd just walk straight past the little alley I was hiding in. Sure enough, he turned into the residential area. He walked halfway across the alley opening, and then visibly began searching for me in the two directions I could have gone. If I'd have kept walking, I would have been very visible. Instead, he gave up after a few seconds of just walking back and forward. He shrugged his shoulders and began walking back from where he came. I went home, shaken by what I'd seen, and asked my bosses if I could possibly not work late Fridays and Saturdays because I'd been followed recently on three occasions. Their response was that it would not be possible to get preferential treatment, and so... If I wanted to be safe, they recommended I take a taxi, which they wouldn't pay for and would cost me an hour's pay for a two minute drive as I lived only a 12 minute walk away from my workplace. Needless to say, I quit shortly after. Last summer, my boyfriend and I went camping in some nature preserve in Pennsylvania. I can't remember the name of it. It was pretty primitive camping, no cell service, and we saw two other people there in the entire place. It was huge, so it was pretty empty. My boyfriend immediately said these two people seemed off to him right away. I don't know if they had anything to do with what happened that night, but I'll describe them. The first person was a woman, who had her truck parked off the trail, and had the hood open. I don't really notice these types of things, but my boyfriend said it looked to him like she was waiting for someone to pull off beside her and offer to help with her truck. Normally my boyfriend is the type to at least offer to call someone, but he said that she skeeved him out. He didn't even want to draw her attention more than was necessary. The next person we saw drove by several times whilst we were setting up. He just kept driving by slowly and looking at us. I didn't even notice though until my boyfriend pointed out that he'd already done it twice before. Whether these two people had anything sinister going on or not, the real story has to do with what woke us up at around 3am. It was incredibly loud and sudden. I couldn't describe it or even compare it to anything. But my boyfriend said that it sounded similar to a chain gun revving up. Or someone using a large tool to scrape gravel. My boyfriend jumped up and looked out the little window of the tent. 
the sound happened again, again, and again, and it was getting noticeably closer each time. I was about to piss myself, but my boyfriend told me it was probably miles off. I didn't question this because loud noises can be heard from miles away, right? Well, later my boyfriend told me that he said this to me in order not to scare me. It really sounded like it was coming from right down the little dirt road. At one point, he said he suspected it was right in front of our campsite. The only reason he didn't tell me to get out and dart for the car was because he would be afraid. It would be someone trying to scare us out of the tent for some dreadful reason. When he whispered, I should have noticed he was whispering and knew something was wrong, since otherwise he would have just spoken normally, right? He would have told me to go back to sleep. However, I couldn't because every little sound I heard outside, I thought was someone sneaking up onto the tent. Eventually, my boyfriend told me to get out and help him pack up. It was about 20 minutes, perhaps, after the sound stopped, and he held onto our only weapon, a machete, in front of him. It was a full moon, so we didn't need a light. And while we were packing quickly, I noticed an empty beer can close to our dead campfire. It certainly wasn't there when we went to sleep at around 10 p.m as neither of us even bought any beer. Thankfully, we got out of there, and the rest of the trip we had a blast, and we either camped in areas well populated by the campers, or got a hotel room. Sometimes, it's just not worth the risk when in the middle of nowhere. When I was a kid, hiking along a coastal national forest area with my friend and his dad. I went alone, down an overgrown side trail to pee. I noticed a stench from the main trail that we figured was a dead animal somewhere, that was nearby, but it was getting more powerful as I went a short distance down that side trail. I stopped at a tree to do my business, and found some trash scattered at the base of it. A cardboard sign leaned against it that read, come and find me, with an arrow pointing further down the overgrown trail. At that point, the stench was so powerful that my nose was starting to burn. I couldn't pee, with my mind freaking out, with all the kind of images of what the hell could be further down the trail. So I went back to the main trail and didn't say anything to my friend or his dad about what I had seen until I couldn't hold my pee in anymore and asked his dad to stop again so that I could pee. When we got back to town, he called it in to the local sheriff. I don't know what they found, if anything, but I can't help but still imagine some suicidal man's corpse or a bunch of dead animals, a budding serial killer slaughtered and arranged somewhere down the trail. I've had my fair share of creepy people throughout my life. Bucharest is a city where things like this rarely happen. So just take it from me. I had bad luck. First of all, let me just say that I'm not your average scaredy cat dude who legs it when someone stares at them for a long time. I'm also not the kind of guy that would hide under his bed if my house gets broken into. You better believe I'll stomp their asses with no regard for my own safety. Keyboard warrioring aside, there have been a few moments that I've had with total strangers that have been genuinely scarring and absolutely terrifying. I'm going to be talking about the most messed up situation that I've ever been in in my life. And I profoundly hope that it never happens again. 
The incident happened four years ago before New Year's Eve. I was 18 at the time, and had finished high school in summer, with no activity and nothing else to do. So I decided to look for something I could do part time, with my limited skill sets and talents. The only thing I was remotely good at was playing video games and boxing. My mum found out about this casting job in a newspaper article, back when she didn't know how to browse the internet. And she called and set up a meeting, without really talking to me about it. I decided to just play along, since I was searching for something anyway, and casting in some shows seemed like an awesome choice. I'm six foot one, and I was skinny at the time. So I figured that they would make me wear stuff like a clothing model. Needless to say, my naivety got the best of me, and I didn't realise that things did not work that way at all. I got to the casting studio, and the place was a total wreck. It was in some run-down building at the edge of the city. No windows. The bricks in the walls were cracked and the withering vegetation was getting a hold of the whole place. It was also strange that there were no people around, but I figured that since this was the city's edgenal, then it should be a normal sight. I realised that there was no front door, so I went down some stairway on the far end of the building, which led me to a rotten wooden door. There was no handle or anything, so I didn't even know if I should try and push or pull it with the tip of my finger somehow. I decided that it must be the wrong place. So I called their number, which my mum provided me with, and somebody answered. It was, well, she said she was a woman, but I thought she was a man at first. See, she had such a low-pitched voice. She was very sweet and patient with me, and told me that this was indeed the building, and that I should go in. I should try to hold the door, and push on it a bit, and then pull it towards me slowly, so it wouldn't break the hinges, and not to be afraid when I go inside, because it's going to be pitch black. Apparently there's no electricity in the area, so I just needed to go forward until I felt another door, and that was going to take me to another hallway which was completely lit up, and then take me into their office. Now hold up. What kind of insane dumbass do you think I am to do this? I've watched too many horror movies to know that this is all kinds of wrong. The lady on the other side gave me a brief explanation of why the office was like this. Apparently, this was an apartment complex built in the 60s, but it got really wrecked after the 77 earthquake, which killed quite a lot of people, because some of the pillars on the second floor were really unstable beforehand, so they had to close it, and no one has really done anything with it since. Since the casting company was really low budget, they couldn't afford to have a nice looking office, and to be in a good looking place, or at least a safe one, one thing I found sketchy is that somewhere in this conversation she said, You're alone, yeah? I thought this was a bit strange, as if she could see me somehow. Her story seemed legit though. I closed the door, opened the rotting door, and sure enough, darkness. I should point out that when I pulled the door towards me, there was a chair in front of the door probably to block it from collapsing inwards, as it apparently swung both ways because of its state of decay. I activated my phone flashlight to look around, and it was just really empty. There were a few chairs in a corner, and a dirty white ragged looking tarp on the ground next to them. The door in the front had the same aspect of the rotting wood. I figured that they would at least renovate that one, to make it look more appealing. 
I pushed the door gently, and it opened with a very loud creak. I think I should have pulled it, but this one didn't have handles either. Everything was still dark. I started questioning the system that they use, and the fact that they're not professional. The lady told me that the hallway would be lit up, yet it wasn't. With my phone light still on, I scanned the room for clues as to where the office might be. I know how this must seem to you, listener. How did I not pick up on this incredibly sketchy situation? I'm just used to this. In the past, me and my parents didn't have light sources in our backyard. So whenever we needed something from the pantry, which also didn't have a light source, we would be in total darkness. This whole thing was getting on my nerves, so I deactivated my flashlight and decided to call the number again. As soon as I put my phone to my ear and the light it emitted turned off, I heard a loud creak behind me. The sound of the rotting door I pushed out earlier getting back into place. I jumped at the sound and let out a sharp yell. I instinctively put my phone out, but the light the dial screen was emitting was too weak to see in front of me. Hello? I asked in a worried voice, but there was no response. But in a second I could hear the dial tone from my phone, and I hear a Nokia ringtone, a piano one, from the other side of the room from where the door had been closed. I stay silent for a moment, and the ringing stops. I have never been more horrified in my life. I crouched down and started moving along the wall to my left, as quickly and quietly as possible. I hear very faint footsteps coming from my right, but I couldn't tell if they're coming towards me. I formulated a very basic escape plan in an instant. I had a general idea of where the door was, and the footsteps seemed to be directionless. I took two coins of 50 bunny out of my pocket and threw them at the corner of the other side of the room and then booked it. I pushed on the edge of the door at first because I ran too fast and had no idea where the door was and I pushed against it to get out the room. I tripped because I was expecting no resistance yet a chair was blocking the other side. I heard scampered footsteps behind me and slight grunts I get up and run away in the dark room with no regard to what I may hit on the path. I just knew the exit would be right in front of me. Sure enough, I hit another chair on the way, the one that I found blocking the door at the entrance, and it propelled me so hard that I bashed the door and knocked it out of its hinges. I opened my eyes and I was outside, so my first instinct was to scream for help at the top of my lungs. I look in the building and I finally see him. A tall, overweight man, probably around 300 pounds, carrying a cloth in one of his hands. He was wearing a white tank top and jeans or sweatpants. And I wasn't really paying much attention at the time, but the expression on his face was one of pure anger. I scampered around and ran up the stairs as fast as I could, and then turned right into town. I ran for about three or four minutes at full speed, not stopping for anything, until I finally reached a main street and saw a lot of cars. I was still in a panicked state, so I beelined to the nearest taxi and told him to take me home. I called my mum when I was halfway and told her everything that happened. She felt sick to her stomach and started crying that she put me in a situation where I might have died. Later that day, I filed a report at our nearest police station, and they sent a dispatch there. We were informed that they found traces of a few blunts, which had cannibal saliva and a double-edged razor on the ground. They also found a broken Nokia flip phone in the dirt outside. My parents told the police that if they find anything else, to please contact them. This has left me with some serious issues, as I know I feel very anxious whenever I go to job interviews. I only feel relatively safe if the location is in a very public place and the interview 
is at rush hour. One man did this to me. By far, the worst New Year's Eve I've ever had. So kids, stay safe. And remember your martial arts training doesn't mean shit when you're scared shitless. I was camping in Lake Tahoe with my family when I was 18. I stepped away from our camp for a few minutes to try and take a picture of this odd looking pine tree. It had all the branches shaved off clean at one side. I had seen down the trail a couple of minutes away and I followed the trail, but couldn't find this enormous pine I was sure had been there. I walked back and couldn't find the camp. Mind you, I was still on the trail. I was either walking in one direction or another, and we were camping right by the clearing that was in no way hidden. I walked back and forth for about 20 minutes and couldn't find anything remotely familiar. I had walked maybe a yard in either direction, trying to find the camp or anything that could lead me to it. I even took to yelling to get my dad's attention, but nothing happened. So I figured I'd return to my original starting point and wait until my dad came for me, but I couldn't find that either. It just seemed as if I were walking through invisible portals that sent me off different parts of the trail. After about 10 minutes of following this trail back and forth and ending nowhere, a little bit of panic set in. I noticed that the woods had become stupidly silent, not quiet, but silent and muffled, as if I were wearing earbuds. Then I heard the ocean, not the sound of water, but the actual thunder of big oceanic waves crashing against rocks. Only that sound and nothing more. Finally, I panicked and just booked it through the opposite direction. After a few minutes of running, I found myself in a familiar spot and then I made my way back to camp. To me, the whole ordeal seemed to take about 30 to 40 minutes tops. My dad actually told me that I had been gone for three hours and that he himself had walked after me and couldn't find me anywhere. I had just moved to Rhode Island and was getting settled when I met this new guy called Joe. And he had asked me out to dinner. We had started hanging out a lot and eventually began dating. After we'd been together for a few weeks, he decided to have his friends Jay and Paul come over for dinner. So they come over and I cooked dinner and we actually got along really well. So eventually, the night led to us all somehow sitting on the floor of the apartment and talking politics. The night was great. Jay had eye problems, so he can't drive. So later, after Paul had already left, Joe went to bring Jay home. On the ride home, Jay started yelling at Joe and freaking out about how he never gets his way and how Joe always has the great catch and how I was everything he ever wanted in a girl. Whilst I was flattered, the outburst was a little scary. Jay then proceeded to demand that Joe pull over and let him walk on. Joe didn't want to drop a half-blind man off in a town he was unfamiliar with at one in the morning, but Jay opened the car door whilst the car was moving and tried to get out. So Joe finally pulled over and let him out. Joe got all the way back to the apartment and told me what happened and I felt awful knowing that he was wandering around the city, and Jay had already texted Joe telling him to leave him alone. So I drove out to find him, and he was 20 feet away from where Joe had left him, and I made him get in the car and took him home. So the next day, Joe tried talking to Jay about the previous incident, and they only ended up getting into an argument. A few weeks later, Jay called me, no idea how he got my phone number, as Joe said he didn't give it to him, in order to apologise to me. The conversation started off fine, but then it got weird. He would go on and on and tell me how much he needed a girl like me, 
and how much he liked me, even in the first five minutes we'd met. He then proceeds to talk bad about Joe, who he had been friends with for over 25 years. They met in a camp for kids with eye problems, you see. And he would tell me about how all the girls Joe had been with, and how bad he was for me, and how I deserved someone like him instead. I told him how uncomfortable this all was, and we got off the phone. Later that evening, Joe came over and we spoke about the phone call. He was pretty upset over it, which I understood. But I told him I just thought Jay was lonely, so we brushed it off. A few days later, Jay and Joe made up and were no longer fighting, but things were still kind of strained. They went out for lunch and I got a text from Joe saying to meet him at a restaurant. When I got there, I find out that Joe never texted me and that Jay had taken his phone and messaged me. It was weird and resulted in another fight. I went home kind of upset. I didn't like to see these two longtime friends fighting, especially saying some of the things they did to each other. Joe was being very defensive about me, and Jay was just being mean. So Joe came over later that night to see how I was, and we watched a movie to relax. He left later that evening, and after about 10 to 15 minutes after he left, I got a phone call from an unknown number. It was Jay, and he said it was an emergency and that he was at the hospital, and that Joe wasn't answering his phone. So I got dressed and got in the car and the hospital. You see, Jay has a form of eye cancer, retinoblastoma, so I thought something might be wrong. On the way there, I called Joe and left him a voicemail telling him what was up. Get to the hospital, and no one with Jay's name was checked in. I called his cell, but there was no answer. So I drove home, and when I got to my house, Jay was on my front steps. I hadn't seen him until I got to the front steps, as I have a very long and dark driveway. I asked him what the hell was going on. I was super scared and nervous at the same time, and he started telling me how much he loved me and wanted me, and that Joe didn't deserve me, and that if I would just be with him, he would be so happy, as would I. He was getting closer and closer to me with every sentence, and I was backing up further and further. It was very scary, and I started to yell at him to stop and leave, or I would call the police, and he wasn't listening. So I felt into my jean pocket for my phone, and I had left it in the car. So I turned and started running for my car, and I could hear him right behind me. I made it to my car and managed to unlock it to get in before he got up. I was just punching in 911 when Joe pulled up into the driveway behind me. He had Paul with him. I guess they went to the hospital to see Jay. They both got out and went to Jay to calm him down. They finally got him to leave and Joe was so apologetic, and Paul had no idea what was happening, because he didn't know any of the other details. They went inside to calm me down, and so that Joe could catch up Paul on the story. They both stayed the night there, and Joe and Paul contacted Jay, and informed him that if he were ever to come near me again, the police would be contacted, and there would be a restraining order placed on him. So fast forward a few months, it's now New Year's Eve, and the three of us had not seen or heard from Jay, and we knew really from the whole situation. So Joe is having a New Year's Eve party at his apartment, and we were all having a great time and enjoying the evening. At around 11.30, the doorbell rang and I went to answer, and guess who was at the door? With Joe's ex-girlfriend, Sarah. I lost it a bit, and almost slammed the door shut in their face. Joe showed up behind me and was trying to figure out what was going on exactly. Turns out, Jay had been contacting Sarah for the past three months, trying to hook her back up with Joe, and he was scaring her immensely, doing to her what he did to me with the phone calls, the harassment, 
and telling her how much he loved her. Tonight, however, she had enough of his crap and told him to meet her at Joe's house. We told the cops that she didn't want him near her and to contact her for her statement. I felt bad about it, but I left my statement as well and we all ended up with a restraining order. When I was stationed in North Carolina, we went to do our early yearly tear gas chambers, which is out in the middle of the woods. We did the chamber, walked out, and I go walk to the corner of the hooch to blow a massive snot rocket because the tear gas clogs you up. I look up and I see a big pile of shiny crimson and a brown mess. Naturally, I go take a look and all it is is the innards of something large just sitting there in a very neat pile looking quite fresh. There was no blood, no tracks, no evidence that anything had happened there other than a huge pile of guts. The area was kind of sandy, so there definitely should have been tracks. Shit was weird. About a week or two later, we went out to the field for some good old motivated infantry training first day out there, we had a long night patrol to do. My squad sets out, with me bleeding, and not even 15 minutes into it, I stumble into an old foxhole. By stumble, I mean dropped like a sack of rocks thanks to all the gear I had on me. I felt like there were a bunch of branches down there, and I felt a couple of bugs crawl around me. No big deal, I'm used to it at this point. When a couple of my squad mates are helping me out, the fourth one shines his flashlight and everyone starts to flip shit and smacking the hell out of me. The foxhole was basically a brown recluse breeding ground and I fell right into it. Yeah, not so used to that. After throwing my camis and gear off and trying to shake them all off me, the guy with the flashlight looks in the foxhole and says, holy shit, there must have been about a million spiders in there. And the bottom was filled with bones, lots of bones. Some buddies and I went camping by a lake one night. At about 1.30 a.m., we heard some rustling in the bushes and just figured it was a rabbit or something. We went over to check it out and found nothing. At about 1.35 a.m., a huge pickup truck that was lifted and blaring loud music drove by on a dirt road really, really slowly, shining a huge police grade spotlight on me and my friends. The truck burnt out and kept driving so my best friend and I decided to drive up the road to see if we could spot anything unusual about the truck. We get to the main road and there are probably seven or eight cop cars, lights flashing and two or three ambulances. We stop to turn around and I swear like a damn horror film, a cop pecks on my window with his flashlight out of nowhere and he asks what we're doing. We told him we were camping and told him about the truck. And he says, well, you boys might want to camp somewhere else. We just had a triple homicide here and we haven't located the suspect. Friend says, so should we be scared? Like a goddamn idiot. And the cop says, and I quote, well, I'm not scared, but there are 20 officers here and we all have guns. I said, yes sir, and tore off back down the campsite. Best friend called the rest of our buddies and told them to pack up gear and not ask questions, and that we had to get out. We literally threw two fully pitched tents in the back of one of our trucks and got the hell out of there. The cops located the killer 
about 30 minutes later at our campsite. When I was a teenager, I used to go camp out by myself. I had a spot that I liked, that was a few fences from my grandparents' house, out in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful not to spook them, but otherwise cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house, and probably about two from my destination. The one time I am thinking of, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something that I wasn't aware of. So, I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up next morning as I went back to the pasture, however, there was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit, and the barrel broke apart. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure that they were not going to be surprised when I found them. They were just gone. There were some bushes and trees though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I kept walking through the place to go home, and it smelled so bad I set down my stuff at the fence line and decided to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun and eviscerated all of them. They had also dug a shallow ravine and piled the bodies in. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there to grab my gear, and my stuff was gone. As in, I set it right down here on this rock, and it was within eyeshot. A quick glance showed me that there was not anything ripped or fallen out. I think Usain Bolt would have not been able to catch me on my way home. I never heard anything else about those cows, and never went back to the old camp spot again. First off, you need to know that I live in a poor Eastern European country. In a big city, but in a bad neighborhood. At least, that's what I've been told. I've never actually encountered any creepy individuals that would want to do any harm. Just your usual vandals and troublemakers. Never anyone serious. I'm also still a teenager and live with my parents. But growing up in this environment, I consider myself to be quite street smart. At around 3pm, my dad left for table tennis practice, and I knew that he would be back around 8. And coincidentally, my older brother and mother left to help out one of my friends clean up their place after the New Year's Eve party. I should have probably come along, but honestly, I felt quite sick and hung over after yesterday's festivities. That was probably the luckiest I've ever been. So all of my family left except me. Naturally, I've been home alone before. So that doesn't really make me uneasy at all. So the evening goes on like any other. I'm re-watching some episode of Skins, when suddenly I feel the urge to snack. Just behind my apartment complex, there is a very well-known supermarket, which I can always rely on whenever I'm in the deep need of a snack. It's about a five minute walk, so I put on my coat and some flip-flops and I'm out. It's freezing balls outside, and I can see the bright lights of the supermarket in the distance, but something was off. In front of the automatic doors, there was a small robust figure. As I get closer, I could distinguish its face. It was a face of a man who I'd seen before. I remember him countless times roaming around our block of flats, but never actually thought anything of him. He was dressed poorly and was staying in front of the doors as if he were guarding them. 
I asked if the supermarket was still open, and he pointed to a paper which was clipped to the schedule. It said it closed at 6pm because of the holiday season, and it was 6.20. I let out a sigh, and wanted to turn around and go home, but he told me in an alarmed voice that there was a very close boutique next to the supermarket, and I told him that I didn't need anything important and that I would be back tomorrow. But he kept insisting that it was only a two minute walk from there, and while staring at me in a weird manner. That was the first red flag, but I found a logical explanation in my mind, thinking that maybe the man was just very eager to help me. Maybe, so that I would give him some money. That sort of made sense, but I was still alert. So I walked to the boutique, took whatever I could find, and wished the shop owner a happy new year and left in a hurry. As time passed, I was getting more and more nervous for some reason. I guess my gut was just telling me that something was off. What made me really switch was the fact that I had been gone for about five minutes, and just as I was passing the supermarket, the guy who was usually roaming the area was nowhere to be seen. At that point, I started jogging towards my apartment, all the while trying to calm myself and imagining plausible explanations as to the why the guy was not there anymore. I get to the bottom of the stairs of the front door and in the distance, I notice a tall dark figure entering the elevator and at the same time, almost as if it were planned, the automatic lights switched on. I desperately ran towards the interphone and clumsily got my keys out to open the door. As I ran to the elevator, it was still running. I live on the seventh floor, and I could see it go all the way up when it stopped at the fifth. I let out a big sigh of relief, but was still skeptical so I took the stairs. As I was walking up the stairs almost laughing, I noticed that above me, the light on the sixth floor was turned on, so that was a bit strange and I kept on walking, and then the light on the seventh floor was on. I stopped, looked above, and hoped that whoever it was would go to the eighth. A minute passed, which felt like an hour, and the light on the seventh floor was still on. So I decided to take some action, and I ran all the way up to my floor, and saw something that would almost make me pass out. The tall dark figure was kneeling on my doorknob, trying to, what I presume was lockpick my door. In these kind of situations I rarely get angry, I just want whatever was going on to stop. So from afar I shout a very weak, hey, and the guy in an instant turns around and stands up. I see him for a split second and he looks terrified. Long black trench coat, a hat and leather gloves. He smiles at me and reveals his yellow unkept teeth. He smiles. Do you know how stomach churning that feels when you stumble upon something like that? And the person just smiles at you? The fear was amplified tenfold. I was shitting my pants and to my surprise, the man took off running. Before he reached the stairs, he mumbled a sorry and got away. I was still in shock. I couldn't follow him or call the police, or even move for that matter. I easily got into the house of my apartment and noticed that a pin was still stuck in there. Yep, he was definitely trying to get into my house. Who knows what he wanted to do. My parents wouldn't be back for a few more hours and I wasn't sure if I should tell them or the cops. Thinking in retrospect, I think this tall man and the man in front of the supermarket may have conducted a plan. It would have been all too convenient for him to catch me off guard like that. Either way, it's a scary thought. One thing is for certain though, I will be keeping a bat in my room from now on. So much for New Year's resolutions. August 18th, 2016. I started a trip on the Allagash Waterway with my Boy Scout troop. We are located in Hampton, Maine, which is a fair distance south of the waterway. We started our trip in a small brook that led into Eagle Lake. It was my first time on the Allagash, 
and being the only rookie, I was placed with the most strong and experienced paddler, Connor. Our canoe was almost always in the middle of a group, which meant we had to keep good pace and my arms were getting tired quickly. In the woods on the bank of Eagle Lake sat two steam engines, the ghost trains of Alagash. The real story behind it had nothing to do with ghosts. The Alagash was a popular waterway used for logging, and after the logging stopped, the two locomotives were left to rust and break down. It was a really neat experience to see those trains, even after their glory days. For nearly an hour, we climbed on those trains, a little wary of the rust and weak points where the train had been eroded away, and soon enough, we proceeded to make our way across the lake. After paddling for another long while, we decided to line up our boats and motor across the rest of the lake. Our canoes formed a giant fiberglass snake that travelled slowly but easily. I even began to doze off, only to be awoken by a sudden jolt. The boat in front had stopped, causing us to crash up against it. The scout in the stern seat turned, watch it. He shook his paddle above his head, splashing me with the grimy lake water. We all resumed paddling, and not long after we reached our first campsite. I set up my tent that I was sharing with my friend Aaron, and without even waiting until dinner, I fell asleep. The next morning came early. It was 5.30, and I was up packing away the tent. Aaron, after arguing with me, was now sleeping in the wet grass. I skipped breakfast and immediately went to packing my canoe for the trip ahead. The day was normal. We just paddled along until we reached the Chase Rapids, where we unloaded our gear into a trailer and then rode down the rapids in our considerably lighter canoes. We then stopped for lunch and continued down the river towards our next campsite. But that night got weird. We all sat on the banks, watching and shooting stars whizzing through the sky. The lack of light pollution allowed the night to show its true colours. Mixtures of purples and pinks and blues blanketed the sky, with millions of stars piercing through it. But near ten o'clock, everyone retired to their bedrooms, and snoring commenced. I stepped outside my tent, debating whether I should risk waking Aaron and facing his wrath or just joining someone else's tent. I turned, looking for a tent that would be big enough for three, when I noticed something. There was a star that appeared to be moving, not fast like a shooting star, but slowly and growing in size. I stood in shock as the star stopped, hovering almost directly above me. I reached up, expecting my hand to go through it, like a beam of light but the star was solid and ice cold, as if I had just rolled out of a freezer. I could now see it was more of an oval shape glowing white. A large beam of light surrounded me, and I felt a strange tingling sensation in the back of my neck. I felt myself being lifted from the muddy ground, and I could feel my body being absorbed into the oval like a water in a sponge. I found myself in a dark room, and a thick mist filled my nostrils and mouth. It stung my eyes and lungs, and my entire body went numb quite quickly, and I blacked out. I awoke in a room that was completely white. It was entirely well lit, but I couldn't identify a light source. My ears were ringing, and my eyes were straining painfully. I was laying on a slab made of cold metal, and I was staring at the ceiling. I was paralysed and cold. The ringing in my ears got worse and worse until it was nearly unbearable. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something that haunts me to this day. Sliding slowly towards me was a hideous creature. It was completely brown with a large head. Two large black eyes were bulging from its face. It had two pinhole nostrils, and beneath them, multiple folds of skin that may have been covered by some kind of mouth. 
the monstrosity had an arm protruding straight from its chest region. At the end of the arm was a large hand that included four fingers. When compared to a human hand, it would say it had two thumbs and two pointy fingers. The fingers were pointed straight out. I later found out that they bent into a knuckle on one hand. It had four long, thin legs that dragged behind it, and it moved towards me. As it approached me, the ringing got progressively worse. As it slowed and leaned over me, I saw that in its hand, it held a long needle-like tool. The creature put the needle in my mouth, and that's when I lost all consciousness. When I awoke, I was laying in about a foot of water, in the shallows of the lake, and I couldn't remember a thing. We paddled all day as if nothing had happened, and it wasn't until that night the memory came back. One of the leaders told me a story about aliens, and then everything became clear. I don't have any intention of going back into the woods ever again. In 2008, I was in ninth grade, and Facebook was really blowing up. Me and my friends were all over Facebook, as most kids were. And one day, I got a friend request out of the blue. The account had an intentionally ugly profile photo, taken straight from the first page of a Google search. The profile was almost empty except for a few crude jokes and statuses, but it had over 500 friends, with a lot of mutual ones with me. I accepted it, because I accepted everyone back then, and forgot about it. It was about a week later that I got a single message from the account saying, Hi. I imagine I replied something along the lines of, Hello. And didn't get a reply again, and I forgot about it until I got another message. This time it said, How was bowling? My friends and I had been bowling the night before, but anyone who had me on Facebook could see that. After that message, all of my friends got a friend request from this account and most of them accepted. I got more messages that were all creepy but explainable. They'd be like, I like your shirt. Straight after I posted a picture of myself. None of this bothered me, and I just laughed it off because it was all information I had chosen to share on the internet. That was until I started to get messages like, When's your mum back? What did you get from the shop? After I'd been out, I assumed it was one of my neighbours watching me, until my friends told me that they were all getting similar messages, and that they were getting worse. They started to get worse for me as well. They included photos of my parents' car parked outside restaurants and shops, and one close-up of the house number at my door. My friends got stuff like photos taken of family members' profiles, and Google Earth screenshots of their houses. But nothing as bad as what I was getting. The groupiest thing I got was a photo of me outside of my school. It was clearly taken from the driver's seat of a car because you could see the passenger door. Neither me or my friends ever told my parents about this. I guess we thought we were old enough to handle it ourselves. Around this time, I got a Blackberry for my birthday. And on the same day, I got a text from a five-digit number saying stuff like, Guess who? And, New phone? They were using one of the old websites to text for free. They continued for about three weeks. And then I told my mom I was getting prank calls and she got me a new SIM. And they stopped for a while. This is when it started getting a lot weirder. So I started hanging around with this kid who I knew from school. And he'd been to my house a few times with other people. But we'd never just hang out, the two of us. We would get the train into the city and just explore and usually end up in the park that's part of a shopping complex. We met with this group of people our age a few times. And they were in that park regularly. I really hit it off with a girl named Beth, who was part of that group and we'd talk for hours. 
I asked her to add me on Facebook, and we searched my name on her phone, and when she found me, her face dropped. We only had one mutual friend. Guess who? She told me she'd been getting really weird messages about her and her friends for a few weeks around the time we met. For a few minutes, she was convinced it was me, and started getting mad until me and my friend showed her the messages we were getting. We kind of bonded over it, and she texted me and called me whenever she got a message, and eventually we got pretty close and sort of went on a date. We went to Nando's and walked in a park on the outskirts of the city, really nice in the summer. Then we went to my house and hung out for the rest of the evening. We lost track of time and it was around 11pm, and my mum didn't want her walking to the train station at this time, and wasn't sure she'd even make the last train. So she offered to drive her home. We all got into the car and got to the toll tunnel that took us into the city. My mum said she was sure the car behind us had been following us for the past two miles, and this kind of freaked me out, but I didn't say anything. We lost the car in the tunnel, got to the city, and made sure Beth got home safely, and drove back through the tunnel. We stopped at a McDonald's a stone throws away from the tunnel, so that my mum could get a coffee, and I think I got a McFlurry and we were pulling out of the car park and I saw the car behind us and I was 100% sure it was the same one from earlier. My mum didn't notice, but it definitely followed us from McDonald's all the way to our neighbourhood, then turned up a different street right before we turned onto ours, but I didn't see anything. It had been a long day and I went to sleep straight away. The next day, I woke up to about 15 messages saying some really messed up stuff. They were quite malevolent, but they weren't threats. Hope you had a good time, dickhead. You shouldn't be doing what you were doing. Did you screw her? These were the kind of messages that were sent. Bear in mind I'm around 14 at the time. I didn't reply to any, and I didn't tell Beth because I really liked her, and I didn't want to scare her away by it. She didn't say if she'd gotten any of the messages, but she did say about a week after that they had gotten a bit weirder, like detailing her dad's job. Eventually, this person got my new phone number and started texting me daily. They'd detail where I was, who I was with, and what I was doing. I made sure there was absolutely no way this information was being shared on social media. My phone's GPS was always off and I rarely uploaded photos of what I was doing. If I did, then I'd wait a few hours before I uploaded it. By this time, most of my friends had stopped getting the messages, but it was just me, Beth, and my friend Kyle. Me and Beth dated for a few months, and then we made it Facebook official. I got a lot more texts. Most of them were blank, but they were all sent from that five-digit service number. I started getting letters addressed to me that would be a blank piece of paper or just scribbles. I don't know how I managed to keep it from my mum not noticing. Beth and I broke up, but remained really good friends. And it had been just under a year since the first message. And then everything, the texts, the calls, the letters, they all abruptly stopped. Beth and Kyle and I didn't get anything either. The Facebook account was deactivated about a month later, and to this day I couldn't figure out who it might have been. I've eliminated all of my close friends. I feel pretty stupid for not telling anyone about it. Beth's family moved to a different city when we were around 17, just by chance. I saw her on New Year's Eve this year, and she told me that last year, she and that her former roommate had some guy stalking them, calling them in the middle of the night, banging on their door. She said they called the police, and the guy was arrested the second time he came to their house. But she didn't know anything about him. She just said the things he would say on the phone reminded her a lot of what our stalker would say to her. Could it have been the very same guy?
I work as a park operator in British Columbia. I work the night shift as their security and collections. One night, it was fairly overcast and super dark. I was parked at the bottom of the road, leading down to the campground. I had the windows rolled down and was playing around on my phone as my shift was almost over. Suddenly, out of my passenger side window, I heard the sound of crunching footsteps moving around. There wasn't anything around that alarmed me, as we generally have bears in the area and other wildlife. I just kind of listened, as whatever it was, was walking around quite lightly on edge about it. Then the sound started to pick up pace, like it was running directly at the truck. It's pitch black, and I've got my hands up ready for something to jump through the side window of my truck out of the darkness. But just before I was sure it was going to make contact with the side of the truck, it just goes dead silent. So I said no thanks, and started up the truck and zoomed up to the cabin to get away from whatever was going on there. So I'm already on edge to the max. I'm just thinking, lock the gate and go home. Yep, just lock the gate and go home. Well, prior to me leaving in my personal vehicle, I have to put the park truck keys away in the shop inside this fenced off compound, which is just so conveniently unlit. So I whip out my cell phone, turn on the crappy LED, and started my way over to the shed. I'm trying not to freak myself out, but any little tick and leaf crunch just has me jittering at this point. I walk through the compound gate, and as I'm walking by the sort of multiple area, I hear this horror loud scream like an alarm triggering on. At this point, my body went into fight or flight, fists in the air, half about to crap myself. The sound persisted, and I recognized that it was the sound of golf carts when they are in reverse. But generally, you'd know if you left that on, because you'd hear the sound on when you parked it. So now my mind is thinking, okay, what the hell turned that on? So I sneak over there, slowly, towards the horror sound, scanning with my phone light scared out of my gourd. I run up really quickly, and pull the reverse lever off, while half expecting it to be some sort of axe murderer trap from a movie. But nothing. I literally tossed the park truck key at the shed, and ran for my truck. Started it up turned on every single road light and backup light that I had, and locked the gate faster than I've ever done before. I even pathetically checked my back seat to make sure that my safe place didn't have anyone hiding in it. Trying to reflect on it does make me uneasy. Working in parks is great, but geez, the night shift can be really creepy. I had just left the West Coast to go to a college in Missouri. In my second year, I started dating a guy who was in the police academy. When he graduated, he ended up being a guard for the South Center Correctional Prison. He was older than me by almost 10 years, and early on I saw a red flag which I sadly ignored. Red flags like how he got a 16-year-old pregnant the previous year and had a son that he never wanted me to meet, and another flag would be when he would start bar fights if I talked to any other guy. Before I went home for Thanksgiving, he bought me a golden lab puppy, who I named Roxy. He kept the dog whilst I flew home, and my parents and I decided I was going to move back to California and finish college because the small Midwest was not my scene. Too many of my sorority sisters didn't care about getting an education, Rather, they would start dating a guy and lie to them about being on the pill in hopes of the trap into marriage when they got pregnant. When I told my boyfriend I would be returning home at the end of the year, he went ballistic. 
I mean really crazed. He would call me non-stop yelling and then crying and then threatening. And he threatened that if I didn't come home, he'd kill the puppy. When I returned, I asked where the dog was and he said that she got sick and died. Later we went into his parents' house for something and his mum pulled me into a private room and told me how he ran over the puppy with his truck on purpose after our phone call on Thanksgiving. A few weeks later after final exams, my mum flew down to help me pack my car and to be shipped home. On the last night, my boyfriend came by my hotel for our goodbyes. He had tried everything from proposing with an ugly cheap looking Marique diamond ring, with my response being, did you get it from Walmart? Where he said, what does it matter if I did? It wasn't for you anyway, as he threw it in the back seat. I was firm in saying we could try long distance, but I was moving home and was done with Missouri. He then locked the doors of the truck, grabbed my purse, and put it on the driver's side seat and proceeded to drive off with me in the car. His home was a two hour drive from the hotel in a small trailer park town near Roller. I pleaded and begged my phone was blowing up, which was probably my mum, and I said she would call the cops. And tell them what, he said. She doesn't have my plates or know where I live. Plus, I am a cop. When we get to his trailer, he locked up my purse in his gun room. It was a very rough night that I blocked from memory, so I won't share any of the details, except I remember being naked and tied up. In the morning, untied, he made me breakfast and said that he had to go to work. I asked him when I could talk to my mum. I even tried playing the game where I needed to call my mum and tell her the good news that I would be staying here with him. He smiled his creepy lip smile and he said he would discuss it later and that I wasn't going anywhere. When he left, I quickly got dressed and tried the door. It was locked from the outside. He had put a padlock on both doors on the trailer. There was no one around for miles, except for his aunt, who also had a trailer on the property. So I broke the kitchen window and climbed out. I ran to her trailer and pounded on the door. I didn't know her other than the occasional wave and said, I'm Kevin's girlfriend and need to use your phone, it's an emergency. I pushed myself into her door because she was going to let me in whether she wanted to or not. I called my dad at home because I couldn't remember my mum's cell number and told him I was okay. Instead of concerns from my parents, I got yelled at that I would miss my plane and made my mother upset that I disappeared to go off with my boyfriend. My parents didn't quite understand what I had just gone through. I tried explaining again, but I was too scared Kevin might come back early. So I asked his aunt to call his mother. She hesitated and then called her saying, there's a strange girl here who says she needs to speak with you. I explained the situation and that my purse was locked inside. She said to hang tight and to keep the drapes shut. The aunt was an old lady and not much of a talker except for the occasional remark about Kevin being an angel. When his mother finally arrived, she had my purse. I didn't ask how. My phone, of course, was dead. But luckily, I was alive with an escape plan. His mum drove me the two hours back to the hotel, and she didn't say much. And when she did, it was about her son being special, and he was a sweet boy with good intentions. And something about when he had an eye on something pretty, he usually had to have it. I knew I needed to get out of the state ASAP. I finally got home, and my parents didn't quite understand the fact that I got kidnapped. They aren't typical loving parents, I know others have, but they understood quickly how Kevin was a problem. Luckily he didn't know where I lived, but he got hold of the house phone number and called non-stop. Both my cell and phone number were off the hook, and my voicemail box full. My dad and I went to the police station and filed for a restraining order shortly after. I started dating someone new and posted on Facebook that we would be going to Disneyland. But last minute we changed plans and headed to go skiing at our friend's cabin. That same week, my father got a call from his private Disney club. Then a man had been asking for me every day waiting outside the entrance. It was Kevin. 
My father told him it was my stalker. And thanks to the power of Disney, security escorted him off the grounds and he was put in the Disney blacklist forever. Finally, during a New Year's Eve party, I heard about him from a friend who lived in the same town where Kevin had gotten a 15 year old girl pregnant right after I had left for California and he ended up marrying her. It scares me to think about what could have been and how lucky I was to escape. Kevin, let's never meet again. I was camping with family over a three day weekend. A few of us didn't have to get back to work. So we decided to camp an extra night. We had been a full campground and it was now just down to us. It was my brother, his young son, me and my young daughter. At about 3 a.m., my daughter woke up and said that she needed to go to the bathroom. She had to drop a deuce, so there was no getting her to squat outside the tent. The outhouse was about 100 yards away through the pitch dark campground, and the fire had gone out, and there was not really any moonlight. I got her up, grabbed a flashlight, and we headed to the outhouse. She did her business, and I stood outside the outhouse. I'd be lying if I said I weren't a little scared out in the woods in the dark miles from anywhere, with my seven-year-old daughter inside a dark outhouse by herself. Luckily, she was quick, and we stumbled back towards the camp in the dark, with just the flashlight to lead us. The walk back was uneventful. We chatted little, and I tried to reassure her that we were safe, out here in the dark, as she had gotten a little scared, as she realized how alone we were in the empty campground. As we got to about 50 feet from camp, my daughter suddenly grabs my hand and whispers, Daddy, who is that? Who's what, honey? I don't see anything. That man right there, who is that? I shined the light where she was looking and I couldn't see anyone. I grabbed her hand tighter and picked up the pace to get us back to the tent, which was the only safety there was up. And I knew that in this dark like this, we were really in trouble if there were some sketchier people out there messing with us. We got back and I got us into the tent and we got into our sleeping bags and I laid there and listened for any sound outside the tent. Of course, there were millions of sounds I hadn't noticed before and each one made me more and more terrified of whoever was out there. As she started to go to sleep, she asked if we were all right, and I said yes, even though I was completely freaking out. I asked her what the man had looked like, and she said he looked like a Native American. I laid there for what seemed like hours, until I couldn't take it anymore. I woke up my brother and told him what had happened. He is a lot more comfortable in the woods than I am, so he got up and got the fire going again. We sat by the fire until daylight, and nothing ever happened. The next day I asked my daughter about the man she saw, and she didn't remember it. To this day, she doesn't remember the event at all, and the area we were camping in is well known for being a historical place where Native Americans had lived and flourished until they were either forced into reservations or killed. Neither my brother or me found any sign of anyone being out there. If they had been walking around the woods, we would have heard them for sure. My only explanation is that she was so tired she fell back asleep and had a little micro sleep or something and dreamt it. But to this day, it still creeps me the hell out. A few years ago, we went on a church trip to one of our favourite concerts that runs on New Year's Eve to celebrate the new year. Not only is it concerts, it has all kinds of other events and things to do besides music. 
we decided to go super last minute. So a lot of the hotels in the area were of course fully booked. And we ended up staying in a rinky dink little roadside motel, about 30 minutes away from all of the events, which was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The entire place was sketchy and made me feel uncomfortable, but I felt like we could deal with it. So we were separated with boys in one room, girls in another, and then chaperones in a different room. We girls get into our room, and the first thing we notice is a back door. What kind of hotel room has a back door? The chaperone staying next to us insists that the door is sealed shut, but still let us know that if anyone were to knock on it, not to hesitate, to bang on the walls to let them know that something was wrong. No sooner than five minutes later, one of the guys comes into our room and, jealous of our back door, throws it open proving that it was not sealed shut as we were told. We locked it and went about our business. Later that night, we get back to our hotel and our chaperones tell us to lock the doors because there were men sitting outside drinking, very obviously drunk, that were catcalling us on our way back to our room. I didn't think much of it and slammed and locked the door which the young girls in our room decided it would be completely okay to always answer without looking first because, well, why would they be knocking on our door if they didn't know us? Not okay and I had to explain to them that you should always look to see who it was before opening the door. It's just common sense. So later that night, I was woken up by an odd sound almost like a tapping. I sat up and glanced around the room before I realized that someone was knocking on our door. I very quietly got out of bed, careful to move as silently as possible and went to the door to check the people, thinking that perhaps the chaperones were doing some weird late night checkup. No sooner than I glanced out, a hand slowly covered my peephole to hide two of the men that had been drinking outside earlier and my heart started racing. I slowly got back to bed, trying to stay as quiet and as calm as possible as the knocking continued, only to see a shadow move out of the corner of my eye and realize that there was someone standing outside the back door as well, barely visible through the blurry tinted window. One of the girls I was with woke up too, Confused, she looked at me, and I used my phone to explain the situation silently, and we both waited terrified. I watched the shadows through the window and hoped that they would go away. At some point, we both managed to fall asleep again, but when I left the room in the morning, there was a paper on the ground in very shaky hand. Seeing your pretty eye was enough. I can still remember that note perfectly, even after I shredded it and flushed it down the toilet to avoid anyone finding it. I was young and stupid. Looking back now, I know 100% I should have gone straight to a chaperone and told them what happened. It could have been a very dangerous situation, and I'm extremely grateful that I had woken up, rather than one of the other young girls, that would have maybe opened the door without checking. I'm also grateful that I like to triple check the doors to be sure they were locked. However, at the same time, it also didn't seem like a big deal to me. Nothing came out of it besides extreme paranoia for a while. But all in all, the only long term was a permanent fear of roadside motels. I did my fair share of camping as a youth growing up in far north Queensland. We do it as teenagers to go pig hunting on big old farms on the tablelands. The farmers would pay us good cash to shoot some kangaroos and wild pigs, which can get into their crops in there. Anyway, me and three friends were doing a bit of pig hunting on a school holiday 
We'd been out there for three days already, and had two more to go. Bagged a fair share of ruse with the farmer, who would pay us good money for them. So we were all having fun, enjoying the freedom of being young youths. To give you perspective, this particular farm was huge. Off-road driving could easily take more than three hours to get from one side to the other. It was really remote, and often we didn't know that we were just on a farm, but someone's private land. The farmer told us that we were the only folks camping there during that time, so to be wary of any strangers we came across that shouldn't be there. On our second to last night, we set up camp near a lot of trees, reasonably close to the river. Nice little flat sandy area, perfect for campsite. We built a fire and settled in for the evening. We had a car radio, busting out some random tunes from a radio station that we picked up. We were talking shit around the fire and doing a little bit of drinking. That night's getting close to midnight. We turn off the radio and started to settle down, just talking shit about going back to school. And that's when we heard some voices. We're talking beautiful female voices, kind of singing off into the distance, kind of drifting on the wind. At first, I thought I was imagining it, but my friends all went silent, and we listened to these voices that sounded like they were singing. There was a long pause of us looking at each other like, what the hell are we hearing? The voices were coming far off in the forest near our campsite, but close enough for us to kind of hear laughter and generally very nice singing. One of my mates is Aboriginal, and I shit you not, he went as white as a ghost. He's dark skinned, and he seriously looked white in the dark. I asked him what was up, and he told us whatever we do, do not go to check out those voices. Aboriginal folk have a lot of stories of these very long slender type people that live in the bushland and they'll sing and talk to hikers and campers to lure them off the main tracks. People used to go missing way back in the Aboriginal history. So the elders would always warn the community not to listen to the voices. Often they would call you when you were out hiking to come see what they'd found or for help. Some of the stories suggested that they would eat you. It was the first time he believed his eldest stories, as the first time he'd heard them, but he saw it's what his elders warned them about. Very, very nice voices sounding quite inviting. He seriously believed this. Me and my other mates were a bit disbelieving. We thought some young girls must have been out there having some fun camping with a bit of drink and were considering going out. As we were discussing it, the voices seemed to get closer and my Aboriginal friend told us not to speak to them and stay by the fire. He literally threw more wood on the fire just to make it brighter. We started getting pretty tense. The voices were around our campsite for about 30 to 40 minutes, easily within 50 meters of us. Now very clear, beautiful sounding voices, and sometimes, I swear to God, I heard them say, come join us, but they went away. Next day, we looked around the area and we couldn't find any tracks at all. No fire pit, no signs that anyone had been around the area at all, nothing. We were pretty experienced at tracking animals and people make big ass tracks. I'll never forget it. We spoke to the farmer about the voices, and he told us that they come and go as they pleased. He sometimes heard them when he's in his house, and he also believes the Aboriginal legends. <laughs>